Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Welcome. Glad that you are here. If you are uh, a guest, we're particularly happy that you're here today and uh, hope that you'll come out and let several of us shake your hand out in the atrium on your, um, on your way out. Take your Bibles and we'll go to John chapter 14. Okay, John chapter 14 is what we're going to go to today. And if you need a Bible, why don't you just wave at one of the ushers and they'll be glad to give you one of those. And if you need a Bible because you don't have a Bible, you just keep that Bible and that'll be our gift to you. And don't be afraid to use the table of contents either. Uh, and uh, cause you know, sometimes you don't know where it is. And so it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the fourth book in the New Testament. So about three quarters of the way over to the right. And um, these are important chapters, chapter uh, 14, 15, and 16 of John and Romans eight, probably um, some of the most significant passages about the Holy Spirit. Let's read what Jesus said in verse 16 of chapter 14. And I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world can't receive him because it's not looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. And so no, I will not abandon you as orphans. I'll come to you. So <clears throat> um, if you've been here any time recently, you know that I've been just sharing a little bit out of my soul and how it was that several months ago I realized that there had been a, sort of my soul had drifted into a malaise and uh, things were sort of dry and I described it as feeling sort of like I was just on autopilot on my faith, almost like I was phoning it in, but not really engaged with it. Still believed everything that I'd always believed, but it just, my heart wasn't excited about it. And I even described it as sleepwalking in my faith. You remember? And I just uh, shared then what happened and how right around Easter, the Lord just brought me into this resurgence and into this renewal and turned on all the lights again and has just been pouring out uh, uh, wave after wave of his spirit upon me and good things have been happening inside my soul. And I've been just deciding to be transparent about all that's been going on, figuring that maybe we can all learn together and I'll be the, the guinea pig. And I've been talking with you about how I decided several weeks ago to try to figure out, so if you could distill down to several essentials, what are the essentials, essential components of spiritual renewal, of spiritual revival, of rejuvenation, what would they be? There are two. The two are, first one that I talked about last week, salvation. You have to have Jesus. You have to have the gospel. You have to have life if there's going to be renewal or rejuvenation. And in the, for most of us, we've had Jesus. Maybe you invited Jesus into your heart some years ago, decades ago maybe. And I talked last week about how there's such a thing as discovering or rediscovering the joy of your salvation. And I talked about how I just in the recent month or so have felt like I've just gotten born all over again. And I think that's the first uh, essential component to spiritual rejuvenation. There's got to be gospel. There's got to be Jesus. There's got to be salvation or a renewed joy of one's salvation. The second of the two essential components is the one that I'm talking about today. And that has to do with the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. So I'll tell you a story. Several weeks ago in the grow group that Suzanne and I lead, um, 
we were just having a great conversation uh, along, and I could just sense in the circle that the, the, the Holy Spirit was working, and people were just locked in, and they were looking in their Bibles, and many of them never owned Bibles. We just went out, and they bought their new Bibles, and we're sort of finding our way through. And, and it's just one of those moments that I just knew the Holy Spirit's working. And then one of the guys in the, in the group, I just love him because he's so real, he's so transparent, he's so honest and, and funny. He, he sort of lurches back at one point. He says, Ken, man, it's like when I'm in this circle, when I'm like in this room and we're doing our Bible study and, and, and all that, it's, it's like I feel it. It's like I, I can feel it. I feel the love. I feel the kindness in my heart. I feel forgiving. And it's like real. He says, but I know what's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. In a little while, we're going to pray, and then I'm going to walk out that door. And when I walk out that door, all bets are off. Because at that point, I'm going to get a phone call, or I'm going to get a text that's not good news, and, or somebody's going to cut me off on the road. And, and it's like everything that I was just experiencing will just go down the tube. And then he said this funny thing. He said, he said so, uh, I, gosh, I just wish there was a way I could figure out how to take you with me, Ken. And we all laughed about it. The picture of uh, me sort of going along on a leash, you know, uh, to work. And, and I'll sleep down here on the floor and, and just sort of remind you, remember what we talked about at Bible study? And, and uh, so we laughed about that for a little while. And, and then I said, but, you know, but, but trust me, <laughs> you don't want me because I'm a mixed bag on my best of days. Um, but what if you could take Jesus with you everywhere? He would go into every meeting He'd ride along as you're in traffic. He'd be there in your marriage. He'd be at every single uh, place. You, wouldn't that be amazing? And we're like, yeah. And I said, well, that's exactly what he offers. See, the verse that we just read a few minutes ago occurred when Jesus had explained to his disciples. Now, I'm going to go back to heaven. And you can picture the disciples going, what? No, this, wow, it's just all getting good. You've done the resurrection and the crowds are big and miracles and you don't want to leave now. He's like, yeah, I'm leaving and I'm, I'm leaving it with you. And I want you to go into the world and, and, and take this thing global. And they're like, no, we can't do that. You need to stay because we're not that good. And it's as if the, the, the Lord, just knowing all that they were thinking, uh, spoke into that and said, no, 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 you're afraid, but you don't need to be afraid. He says, it's really a good thing for me to go. Because see, as long as I've been here with you, there's only one of me, and I can only be at one place with one person at a time. But if I, and when I go back to heaven, then I can send my spirit and my spirit can be inside of all of you at the same time. So that's why it's really better for me to go so that then I can send my spirit into the world. And so instead of being beside you, I'll ride inside of you. It's even better. And so that's the context uh, for the passages that we were um, just reading, which really, when you think about it, is yet another thing that separates the Christian faith from every other major world religion. In every other major world religion, what do you have? You have a founder who people came along and said, well, I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to try to be as much like you and believe in all the things that you said. And I'm going to do the things you did. And, da, 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 da. and they die and it goes on. And, you know, 1,500 years later, people People are still trying to do all the things that he did and all the things he said. And Christianity is not that. Christianity is like, no, you'd never be able to do it all. Not on your own strength. No, I'm going to do one better. Jesus says, I'm going to come inside of you through my spirit. I'm going to live in you. And we'll have a relationship which is going to make things all different, different good, different better in your life. So he says to the disciples, I want you to go back um, and wait. 
okay? I am telling you, you're going to go into all the world and you're going to make disciples and you're going to take this thing global, but I don't want you to try to go do it on your own strength. <laughs> trust me, that ain't going to go good. So you go back to Jerusalem and you just wait. And they're like, wait for what? He's like, because I'm going to send my spirit. How long would it take? It would take 10 days. So they just are waiting, waiting, waiting. And then whoop, boom, 10 days later, 50 days after Easter, the Holy Spirit comes, comes in. And it's described in the book of Acts chapter two as, as sort of like this tornado, sort of this wind of the Holy Spirit just, just comes upon them there. And all sorts of unique, special, exciting types of things happen. Not the least of which is that Peter stands up and he begins to preach. And this, I think, is particularly interesting because Peter had never really been a, 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 a preacher. He'd always been a fisher. And so you, you and, and for that matter, you know anything about Peter's life, he was kind of always a little bit klutzy and uh, brash and impulsive and he'd stick his foot in his mouth and he'd kind of do the embarrassing thing and they're like, oh, Peter, you know. So, and, and so, you know, <clears throat> and now Peter stands up and he starts to preach, but this one's coming out right and it's making sense and people are listening and more people are coming, and now there's hundreds, and now there's thousands who are coming to, and don't you know, Peter's thinking to himself, what is going on? I always say the boneheaded things. Now I'm, it's like it's working, and it's connecting, and the, look at him listening to me. What is going on? I'm a fisherman, not a preacher. Well, what is going on, Peter, is the Holy Spirit now is inside of you, and the Holy Spirit's giving you that anointing, and that's what's, it's not you, Peter, because left here own device, you'll chop the guy's ear off and you'll say, let me walk on water. Ah, you know, and that's you, Peter, on your own flesh, but full of the Holy Spirit. It's a whole different ball game. And he gets to the end of his sermon. And at this point, he's told people, you need to give your hearts to Christ. You need to follow him. You need to bury your sins in baptism. And 3,000 people, it says, are like, I want to do that. He was like, what? Are you serious? 3,000 people? Yeah, because, not because of you, Peter. Because of the Holy Spirit, who's now operative inside of you. So the Holy Spirit comes there in the, uh, in the early church. And this is what changed everything. And the Holy Spirit is what still changes everything. So any number of you have said things to me along the lines of, wow, we really like the new improved kin, you know, or we really like, you know, the re-energized kin or the different things you've said, different ways you've said it. We can tell something's happening. What's going on inside of you? Well, I would have to say, the Holy Spirit's given me a, a fresh touch here in the recent weeks. Not the first touch. Uh, I've had plenty of other touches throughout my life of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to explain those touches of the Holy Spirit in just a moment, try to bring some clarity, because I think we get confused about those. But I have been experiencing a fresh touch lately, and it just makes all the difference. Now, because this whole concept of the touch of the Holy Spirit or the filling of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, sometimes it's referred to, um, is, gets kind of uh, a little bit confusing, especially if you're new to the faith. Sometimes people who are newer to the faith, they're like, okay, you know, kind of conceptualize of God the Father and the Son, Jesus. The Holy Spirit, though, that's a little woo-woo. That seems a little, I don't know really what to do with him. And so, as some have pointed out, many Christians today have sort of created a little bit of a different trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Bible. There, that seems a little bit more manageable, but that's not um, the three manifestations. He says, I've, been, I've shown myself to as Father in creation, as Son for 33 years on this earth that you could see and touch and now as my Holy Spirit. Same God, not three gods, same God. Just different ways that he's shown us himself. And so we oughtn't be afraid of talking about his Holy Spirit. 
Um, so let's talk about this whole concept of the filling of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to give you an outline that I think will help you to be able to categorize some things. It's a threefold outline, three points, if you're, take, if you're a note taker. Okay, so the, the, and we'll, we'll just call them in, in broad brush strokes, three fillings of the Holy Spirit um, that people refer to. The first is this. This is what you might call the initial filling of the Holy Spirit. What's the initial filling of the Holy Spirit? This has to do with when you first trust in Christ, when you first invite Jesus to come into your heart and you accept him as the Lord and the Savior of your life. This is your initial filling of the Holy Spirit. This is, this is your profession of faith. This is when you're justified. This is when you're regenerated. But I think a lot of people errantly think, you know, boy, I, th this was just a good day for me. I woke up and I decided, I think I'm gonna put my faith in Christ today. You know, I done good. Nah, there's a little bit more to it than, knew, than you knew what was going on. If you could see in the spiritual realm and if you could reverse engineer, you would think back to this conversation when this person explained to you about Jesus coming to the world and dying for your sins. Think about this person who invited you to come to this camp or to this service and you went and you felt something. Think about this, think about this, think about this. You're like, oh, there was some stuff going on. Yes, what was going on? The Holy Spirit was at work leading you, wooing you, calling you, and bring you to that point where you finally said, I want to invite you, Jesus, to come into my heart. This was all a work of the Holy Spirit. That initial filling of the Holy Spirit was consummated, though, when you put your trust in Christ. You can read more about that in Romans 8, 9, or in Galatians 4, 6, or in Ephesians 1, 13, all of which talk about when his spirit uh, comes first into you as a believer, okay? Now, one thing more that we would say about this initial feeling is it's a once and done. I think there's confusion about this. Sometimes people invite Jesus into their heart and then they lapse back into some sort of sin or some sort of pattern. And uh, they begin to think to themselves, you know, I don't think Jesus could possibly be in my heart anymore. I'd better go back to church and I better invite him into my heart again. And, but then they lapse back and then they say, well, I'm gonna invite him into my heart again. And they lapse and I'm gonna invite him into my heart again. And you, you know, and you accept Jesus 500 times. Now, that's not really whatever needed to happen. This is a once and done. When you invite Jesus Christ to come into you, he comes by the power of his Holy Spirit. You say, well, then what's going on when I have lapsed back into sin or when I've exploded in rage over someone or given into pornography or, or lust or, or other sorts of things or addictions and such? What, what is going on then? Where is Jesus then? Because I know he's not very near. Yeah, well, he hadn't moved out, but you've certainly moved him over. If he was driving the car and, so to speak, holding the wheel, you have reached over and you have moved your into the driver's seat and you would move Tim over in a shotgun or more likely into the back seat or if you have a van maybe all the way to the third row or maybe to that little compartment in the back behind the third row okay and and that's where he but he's still with you you just aren't yielded to him anymore now you're back in charge that leads to the second filling of the Holy Spirit, the second category that we need to talk about. And this we'll call the ongoing fillings of the Holy Spirit, okay? That initial one, that's a once and done when you invite Jesus to come in. He's in, his Holy Spirit just came in. He sealed you with his Holy Spirit. Now, the second one, this is the one that is this ongoing struggle that we have in life with what scripture calls our flesh. There's living in the spirit and there's living in the flesh. You know that you're living in the spirit because when you're living in the spirit, you find yourself saying things that you're like, wow, I can't believe I said that. That was so gracious and I'm not even that nice. You know, and, and what's going on? Well, the Holy Spirit just was working inside of you. Why? Because you're yielded to him. You just forgave that person. Uh, you know, you just turned the other cheek. How did I have the strength to do that? 
it's the Holy Spirit. You're yielded to the Holy Spirit and he's carrying you along. But the problem that all of us have is that the devil comes along and he says to you, yeah, but now you know really um, life would be a little bit letter, let better if you would give into this uh, lustful thought or into this uh, pornography or into this substance or you should just go and spend a bunch of money because that's going to make you feel so much better if you go and buy some things and shop and these sorts of things. Or, or it can work in a, in a way where you're like, you know, I don't feel good about myself. I'm ugly and I'm unattractive and I'm fat and you start thinking all of these sorts of things. You start giving, what's going on? You're not being controlled and yielded by the Holy Spirit anymore. Now you you have lapsed into the flesh, you have grabbed that steering wheel, and you have in essence said to the Holy Spirit, I'll be in charge because I don't know that you really can get me where I need to go and get me to the place that is best in my life. So I better just take charge of this one. It even affects the way that we give ourselves into worry. Why do we worry? We worry because we're convinced I can't trust Jesus. Really, at the root of every sin, if you reverse engineered them all, it all goes back to the question of can I, will I trust that Jesus is better? At the root of all sin is self-reliance, not surrender. Self-reliance, I gotta take care of this. I've gotta meet this need. I gotta appease this, this feeling. I'm not gonna feel complete if I don't do it. No, that's not the Holy Spirit right there. That's your self-reliance. That's your flesh. And you just move the Holy Spirit right over and you're not, you're quenching the Holy Spirit. You're not yielded to the Holy Spirit now. And and even when I say this, I know that any number of you are going, yeah, boy, I've had that experience. I have that experience like even this morning. And you know, And the temptation for us is to say, okay, but this is a good word. I needed to hear that word. Thanks, Pastor Ken. You know, I I wanna be a good Christian and I wanna follow Jesus. And so by golly, I'm not gonna do that this week. I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving into it anymore. I'm just gonna have more willpower than I've ever had before and, and I'm gonna win. No, you're not gonna win. You know what? Willpower doesn't work. The only thing that works is surrender. Surrender, just looking to Jesus and saying, okay, even though it's hard for me to believe that you are better, that you would provide more, I I am surrendered to trusting that you do love me more and that you would have better for me than what I might be trying to, to control or get my mind or my body involved in doing right now because I think that that would actually be better. I'm gonna surrender, I'm gonna trust that you are better. Now, this type of filling, and when you look at him, he breathes his Holy Spirit back in, and you take that step of obedience. Let me illustrate. This is, the, this is something that happened in my own life just the other day. It was going along, and I think I felt pretty full of the Holy Spirit. I did have a lot of things to do, and being sort of a type A uh, task list kind of person, I was sort of thinking, okay, if I get this done by then, I'll be on schedule. If I get this done by four, then that. And there's a business not very far from here that I sometimes stop in uh, for. And over time, I've become friends with the owner, who is a Muslim, and have been trying to help him to understand Christianity a little bit. And he's been very intrigued about this whole thing, this whole faith bridge thing, because he drives by and, and he sees it. And <clears throat> uh, I bet we've talked about it a dozen times. So, so you're the founding pastor. Yeah, I'm the founding pastor. So you were here when it all, yeah, there was just like three of us. We were just in my apartment. And, and so I go into the business the other day and um, I kind of had in mind that, you know, this will be quick and then I'll move on to the next thing. And I walked in and there was nobody else there. And I looked at him, look at me, and I thought, "Uh uh-oh, this is a talking day. And, uh, (laughs) And so I'm paying out and he looks at me and he's, he said, So you're the founding pastor at Faith. I'm like, yeah, yeah, still true. You know, we talked about this a dozen times. And I remember him saying, so what I can't figure out is how did you, like, how did you get so many thousands of people? How did that happen? And 
I was so on the brink of saying the following. I was just, it was on the tip of my tongue. I almost just, because I really wanted to get to the thing that I just get on my list and get my list done and everything. And I was so close to saying right then, well, you know, sometimes things just come together. See ya, you know, and, <laughs> and even when I was on the tip of my tongue, I felt the Holy Spirit say, are you going to surrender to me? Or are you going to answer in the flesh? And in that moment, I just, all of this has to happen. You, 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 what we learn how to in, experience this, this ongoing filling of the Holy Spirit. And you have to make this transaction over and over in the spiritual realm, minute by minute. And in that moment, I said, okay, Lord, Lord I'm looking to you. I'm trusting you. And I sensed him say, go ahead and tell him the honest truth. And I said, well, Abdul, the, <laughs> the reason that there's so many people, I, I guess, is because of our message. And when I say our message, I don't mean like me, my message, because there's a number of us who, who, who give the message. I'm not even the best one. When I say the message that we give and why the people come, what I'm talking about, Abdul, is it's this message. There's a brokenness in this world. You don't have to, but just watch one cycle of news and say, good night, this world is broken. He's like, yeah, it is. I said, and then you begin to look in the mirror and if you're honest, you begin to realize, I'm broken too. And there's these things about me that are wrong and bad. He's like, that's true. And I said, in every other religion that ever came along, had a founder that said, if you'll try to be as much like me as you possibly perfectly can be, maybe in the end, things will be right and the brokenness of your life and the brokenness of the world will come back together and it'll be fixed. So follow my religion. But that's not what Jesus said. Christianity is a different thing altogether, I said. See, Christianity is about God looking down upon us all of us broken people and having mercy and pity and love and grace and saying, you can't fix yourselves. You're that broken. The only way that you can ever be fixed is if I fix you. And that's where God said, so I'm gonna send my own son into the world, my flesh and blood, and he's gonna live the life of perfection that you couldn't live. He's going to be sinless in a way that all of us wish that we could be. And then he's going to die on the cross, taking the punishment, taking the hit for your sin and my sin. He's going to stand in our stead. And then on the third day, after he was crucified and dead, he was raised to life. And he says to the whole world now, come with me. Follow me into life, and I will infuse you with my life-giving Holy Spirit. I said, I guess, Abdul, that's how come it's grown. Because that's the message that people deep in their heart, when they hear it, they're like, that makes sense. I would like that. And as I walked to my car, in those moments I felt the Holy Spirit say, that is what I wanted. And that was the most important thing you did this whole day. And it wasn't even on your list. Now, why did that happen? Because in that moment I was yielded to the Holy Spirit. Oh, it's so close to not being yielded because I just, I'm gonna do my, but we do that, don't we? We do that at, at home with our children. We do it at our spouse. We do it in the workplace. There, there's, who knows how many, probably dozens, hundreds maybe of, of crossroad moments in, in, in every single day that we're gonna have to decide, am I gonna be yielded to the Holy Spirit? Am I gonna be filled anew with the Holy Spirit? Am I gonna be surrendered to what he wants to do with, am I gonna trust him enough to say, okay, it's not what I would have done, but I'm gonna look to you, Jesus, because you're good, and I'm gonna trust that through your Holy Spirit, good will come from this. It's a crossroads that we come to many times during any and every 
day. I think this is why Paul wrote some interesting words in Ephesians 5. You remember in Ephesians 5, he said an interesting thing. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He was saying, now, I don't want you to be drunk with wine, okay? Because that'll ruin your life. But instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the interesting thing about these words, be instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, is if you could see it in the original language, it's, it's the present progressive tense, which could be translated in English, instead of being filled with wine, be continually, ongoingly, steadily, regularly, over and over and overly filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so now let's illustrate. Paul is uh, writing and he's using a metaphor that anybody could understand, including you and me. So, he's saying, now, I don't want you to get drunk on, well, we'll do that. (laughs) Unless they want to make a donation to our Woodlands Land Fund. (laughs) Then I would do that, but... All right, now, so what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, okay, you know how this works, right? If you do this, and you take this one down, and you take another one down, and another, and another, and another, you keep on being filled. What? You'll have a good little drunk going. You'll have a good buzz going along, right? You're going to be inebriated. He's saying now, in the same way that that ain't a good thing for you. But apply it. Think about it. He, Paul was also inferring, if you stop being filled with all this, then you're going to go back to your normal mind. Now, flip it over. In a negative way, he was illustrating positively what this whole concept of the filling of the Holy Spirit. He was saying, now, I want you to be ongoingly, steadily filled, refilled, refilled with the Holy Spirit. You got to keep on filling up with the Holy Spirit throughout the day. This isn't like a one and done. This isn't a one and done for the whole day. This is, you're going to have to keep being filled ongoingly. Why? Because if you aren't, you'll go back to your normal mind. And if you go back to your normal mind, that ain't a good thing because you're grabbing the steering wheel and you're saying, I'll do it my way. And you're in the flesh and you're yelling or you're doing the wrong thing. And he's saying, no, no, you got to keep on being filled with the spirit so that you won't go back to your normal mind so that you'll be yielded to the Holy Spirit. So this is the second category um, of filling. Sort of this ongoing, it has to do with surrendering, really. You have to sort of in the moment just say, I confess, Lord, I'm really wanting to go this direction because it really might feel good or be fun or settle the score or whatever, and that's where I want to go. But I know that you are better. You're better. Oh, that might be feel better in the first 60 seconds, but it won't feel better 60 days from now or 60 years from now. You are better. So by faith, I'm looking to you, Jesus. I'm not even relying on my own willpower. I'm just asking you, Jesus, to flood me with your Holy Spirit, and I will take one step to do what you've called me to do. But you do that. You take just one step in that instance of obedience and faithfulness, and what will happen is all of a sudden the, the, the horizons open and you see how you can take the next step and he gives you the grace to do it. And you continue to do that, you're walking by faith. You're walking in the spirit. It's sort of, he's carrying you along in a way that I got thinking about last weekend. One of our boys, the younger one, uh, said to us a few weeks ago, I've never been to the beach. He's nine years old. Suzanne and I said, my gosh, we're bad parents. And... <laughs> So we called up and we got a place to go. And so we went to Galveston. And we didn't tell him there's nicer beaches in the world, but you know, it's, <laughs> it'll do. And so <clears throat> we get down there and had a fun couple of nights together. And, but I noticed an interesting thing. Our whole family did. We were looking at it, how the seagulls, um, when they are um, flying along Seawall uh, Boulevard, 
they're not flapping their, their wings. You just watch them. They're, 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 just, they're just out there just gliding. And they're going as fast as the car is going. And we're like, how did they do that? Well, I had to know. So I Googled it and found out <clears throat> the way that they're doing that is because in the heat of summer, there, there is what is called thermals, uh, which are blasts of hot air that are coming off the, the, the beach, off the sand, off the concrete. And it's sending this hot air up. And all the seagull has to do in the heat of summer is just spread its wings out because that wind that is those thermals are going up. That's just, and so it's not having to do the work. It's just soaring along. And even as I was reading that, I was thinking, oh my gosh, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit wants to do with us. God's saying, I, I would like you to just soar along and I'll just put my divine thermal under your wings. But what do we do? We, we say, no, I think I know better. And so I'll just be in charge here and we'll just do it my way. And I know I'll get further, faster, better. And all the while he was saying, I don't know why you don't just let me carry you along in the winds of my spirit. Walk in the spirit, he was saying. So this is the second uh, sort of filling of the Holy Spirit. Then there's the third category. We'll uh, just talk for a few minutes about it, and then I'll spend maybe a little bit more time talking about this third one in the postscript. Um, this is what we'll call the special fillings of the Holy Spirit. Um, this is the category of filling that perhaps more than the first two uh, gets the most confusing and misunderstood and sometimes uh, even a little bit misconstrued to people along the way. Um, let me illustrate maybe in a way that's pedestrian or we can understand. You know, if you've ever gone to a concert, you know that throughout the concert, you've got your, your, your big numbers and then the lights will go down and then there's this softer, you know, ballad kind of number and then they'll build it back up and then there's, you know, and then and there's kind of this, this movement that goes through concert. But then things begin to build towards this, this big pitch towards the end. And you know you're getting towards the end. Why? If you study what's happening on the stage, typically it's getting a little bit louder and the lighting, it, it's like they're turning up the lights and sometimes there's pyro at the end and you're like, okay, we're getting towards the end, you know? And, and they couldn't do that for all two or three hours, you know, or else everybody would just be fried and the artists that have coronary arrest and it just, it just wouldn't work. And so you, but you build to this fevered pitch at the end and it's like, good night, Houston. And, and they walk off and, and everybody's like, wow. And then they come back out and they do a, a finale. And in that finale, it's like the lights get even brighter and uh, it gets even louder and more explosive, you know, it's, it's, you're like, wow, that was really special. And you go soaring out of there and, and, well, in a similar sort of way, the Holy Spirit from time to time comes with this floodlight ministry. It's just like the lights get a little brighter and it just gets a little clearer. It's like, whoa, and you just feel his presence. Sometimes maybe you've had this experience, you've been in a worship type of experience and somewhere along the way, you just almost feel like, wow, the Holy Spirit is here. I wouldn't mind if this just went on for another five hours because I just feel the Holy Spirit so here. I've, I've had the experience even when I'm preaching along uh, sometimes. And, and I'm going along feeling a little bit like Peter and thinking, wow, this is coming out even better than I planned. And I should have written that part down. I didn't even think of that. And what's happening? Well, a special filling of the Holy Spirit. Um, in the old days, they used to call that the unction of the Holy Spirit and just refer to he's under the unction right now of the Holy Spirit. And, and I've watched it with others of our preachers up here. And just it's, it, it, you you've been around a, lot, a while, you, you can begin to say, I just can see that f switch got flipped on. And it's just like the anointing of the spirit is extra upon him now. He's preaching better than he really is. Um, he's, he's, he's out preaching his ability. Why? It's the Holy Spirit is going on. That's what's happening. Sometimes you experience it in community. I was thinking about, I told you earlier about the small group that at that very same night, that the guy said the funny thing. Uh, well, there was a point right around that, right before he 
lurched in with his funny commentary about me going around um, with him. Um, I remember in that moment, just sort of looking around, realizing, oh, <laughs> Holy Spirit, I can tell you just moved in here. Somehow in the last three or four minutes, you, you're running the show. You're driving the conversation. I can just tell you are at work right now. I'm not even the leader at this point. You're leading things now. Several nights later, I had supper with one of the guys. Not the guy of the earlier story, but yet another guy. We had supper together just to process some things. Um, he said an interesting thing. And you have to understand, this is a, a group with mainly people who they're brand new to Christianity. They, they, never, they just recently bought their first Bibles. It's awesome. We're excited. We're, what kind did you get? What kind of, and, and, you know, and, and so it's, it's just so fun just seeing God open eyes and see new things. And so I'm having supper with this guy. And he said, you know, re, my wife and I, we really like this group. I'm like, oh, well, good. I'm glad. So we do too, Suzanne, and I love it. And uh, He's like, you know, it's just, it's, I, I've never been in anything exactly like our, our grow group. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, you know, it's just like when, when, when we get in there, it, it's, it's like it just, it just feels uh, so, and I was really curious what word he was going to choose so I wasn't helping him, safe. I said, oh, it does, huh? He said, yeah, it just feels so safe when we're in there and we're like looking at the Bible and learning things. And I said, well, you wanna know what it is that you're experiencing? Let me give you some, some help. You're experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's what you're experiencing. That's why you feel that safety or that peace that surpasses all understanding. That's what's going on is the Holy Spirit has moved in in that moment. Because trust me, I said, I'm not that good. <laughs> I can't engineer that. I can be a conduit and I can sort of try to get things going and we'll just, but we're going to have to trust if, the, if there's going to be a special touch of the Holy Spirit, he's just going to choose to move in on us. This is a special touch of the Holy Spirit. Now, throughout history, Christians have attested to any number of uh, special events happening with special feelings. Sometimes people say, I spoke in tongues. Sometimes people say, I just felt this, this prophetic word, like this word of knowledge I just needed to go and share with this person. Some people attest to just feeling so bold evangelistically. It's just like weird. I just, I just felt like I had to tell them, you got to accept Christ because if you don't accept Christ, you're going to go to hell and I don't want you to go to hell and I love you and listen to me. I don't ever say these things. Why am I saying this? What? You're just under the unction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's working in you. That's what's going on right now. Sometimes it, it manifests in generosity. You see that in the book of Acts as well. These people were just so under the, the touch of the special feeling of the Holy Spirit that they're just like, just take all our money and, and let's just give it all away and let's just see if, if we can't reach more people. I see that happen today. Sometimes people just, they're just under a special touch of the Holy Spirit and they're just like, just feed all the kids, you know, just build the building, just do the deal. Why? I just, I just got to do this. What happened? Nah, you weren't in control then. The Holy Spirit just moved in and gave you a special touch. And I'm telling you, there's nothing like it. You say, well, how would I know if I've had it? Well, probably the same way that you'd know if the concert had come to a finale. You'll just know. But this one, unlike the first two, it's not one that we can uh, contrive or engineer um, or manipulate. Not that you can manipulate any of the other two. Uh, but we do play a more active role as an active agent in those first two. Confessing faith for the first time. Asking for the refilling to surrender over and over. This third type, um, we don't get as much say in. Sometimes though the Holy Spirit just moves in and you know that, you know that, you know, he's there. Well, I'll say a little bit more about that one and maybe a few other things. If you have questions, you can text them in. But what I wanna do in our final minutes is actually spend a few minutes praying and asking that the Holy Spirit might come 
in our midst right here. So I'll ask you not to uh, get up and be distracting and start walking out. Let's just stay for a moment and let's pray uh, in all our rooms and <clears throat> I'll lead us. Um, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come fill this place, the atmosphere. Once you, Holy Spirit, I just work right here. I want to pray in three different movements. The first movement has to do with that first touch of the Holy Spirit. Some of you here, hearing my voice, you have never stepped over the line of faith in the first place. You've never invited Jesus to come into your heart. You've never crossed that line. And the Holy Spirit is just telling you today is your day. It's time for you to surrender your life and let me come in. Let me bring the touch of my spirit, the power of my spirit, the ministry, the healing, the forgiveness. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So even now, in this quiet moment, I just invite you to invite him and just say, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life. I need that first touch of your spirit that marks me and seals me and saves me. I want to be born again. Come into me, Jesus. All of us have points at which we need that second touch of your spirit. Probably we bombed a time or two already before we even got to church. We were at a moment in a conversation uh, where we could have yielded to your Holy Spirit, but we didn't, and we gave in to the flesh. Even in our own thinking, we could have been filled with thoughts of you, Jesus, as we got ready for church, but we gave in to our fleshly desires and started thinking damaging thoughts, damaging to ourselves, perhaps even damaging to other people kind of thoughts. Lord, my prayer is that you would do a new thing in our hearts even right now. I just invite you, friends, hearing my voice in all our rooms, you confess, you know, the Lord surely brought to your mind even now. This is what I need to confess. This is where I have not been yielded to the Holy Spirit. Why don't you confess that to him and admit, I'm guilty and I want to change, but I know I can't change on my own. I know I don't have enough willpower. I never will. Nobody ever does. And so I'm going to surrender. I'm just, I'm going to like open up my clenched fists and I'm going to surrender and I'm going to look to you and I'm going to trust Jesus that you are more and that you are better than any alternative I could have grasped for in the flesh. And I'm going to take one step because maybe that's all you got the energy to take. You take that one step and you see if he doesn't then give you more perspective and ability to take a second step and a third step and you step in faith. Let that divine thermal catch you up and carry you along. You don't have to do the flapping. You let him just lift you up. So surrender to him. Holy Spirit, won't you come into our surrendered hearts and touch us anew. And then give us the grace to do that again this afternoon. After lunch, we'll surely have to refill again. And by supper time again, and probably by bedtime again, and probably in the morning, and just ongoingly, just in the same way that Paul was saying, you're going to have to keep on drinking if you're going to keep on being filled and not in your right mind. Lord, flipping that in the illustration upside down, we have to be filled over and over and over and over with your spirit or else we will go back to our normal mind and our normal mind is the one that sinks our ship every time. Help us to continue to step faithfully walking in your spirit. And the Lord, I pray for 
that third category, that just that special feeling that sometimes you bring upon individuals, sometimes you bring it upon us on, on a retreat, like a walk to Emmaus retreat or a spiritual awakening uh, sort of retreat or a mountaintop experience or a mission trip. And sometimes you bring it upon us even just as we're reading your word and tears begin to come out of our eyes and we just feel your presence and we know you are there and we just know it is real, it is real, it is real, it is real that you are here. Sometimes you come upon groups of people, whole congregations, won't you come Holy Spirit? In a way, uh, we can't prescribe. We're just asking however you would that you will and make us receptive to all that you wanna do so that we can walk full of you. And we pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. I think we should say thanks to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director here at FaithBridge, and I'm here with founding pastor Ken Werlein, who just talked about the second part of this revival that's been going on in your life. Welcome, Pastor Ken. Thank you. Uh, so last week we talked about the first thing, which was mm -hmm. your reawakening the and, joy yes, of your salvation. Uh, and storing this uh, joy of your salvation. And this week we talked about this recharging that yeah. you've had yeah. from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, we talked about three uh, sort of touches categories. or categories categories mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. We talked about first the initial one mm -hmm. when you're saved, mm -hmm. um, the second one which is your ongoing sanctification mm -hmm. and surrender, mm -hmm. um, and then you mentioned the third one. And as you talked about the third one, uh, the kind of the special touch of the Holy Spirit, you mentioned that this category can be maybe the most confusing. It can be. Um, and so yeah. can you talk to us a little yeah, bit more yeah. about that category? Yeah. Um, entire churches and denominations are founded uh, sometimes by precisely what they have decided on this third category, this, these special fillings of the Holy Spirit. For example, <clears throat> um, a little more than 100 years ago, in the early 1900s, um, out at Azusa Street, you had a group of Christians who the Holy Spirit just moved in on and um, it was unmistakable, and the recurring thing that seemed to be happening with many of them is that they were speaking in tongues. Hmm. And it was out of this that the modern uh, charismatic or Pentecostal movement, um, I'll just lump those in together, um, sort of got going along. Now, what happened is that then people, um, in successive years, decades go by, and maybe the Holy Spirit isn't touching quite so palpably, mm -hmm. but they're still saying, this is the mark that we're looking for. Have you spoken in tongues? Nope, okay, then, then you haven't got it yet. Um, well, I think we have to be careful about being prescriptive rather than descriptive about here's what happened in this situation. You go over, there's another group of Christians that came along and ultimately find their way upstream to one of my heroes, John Wesley. This is the Wesleyan holiness um, Christians. And they look at uh, what happened with John Wesley and mm -hmm. he had this, this moment that he referred to as when he was just so caught up in the touch and the unction, the power of the Holy Spirit that it was as if he just couldn't even sin. Hmm. It just it just couldn't even sin. He just, his, the love of God was shed abroad in his heart. He just, he had perfect love. Well, doctrines out of that formed the doctrine of perfection. Okay. Like I could be perfect, yes. You, you probably can't sustain it, but in those moments you can be caught up and you can be perfect in love and in fullness of the Holy Spirit. And those Christians began to refer to uh, the experience as, and you know, sort of their trigger phrase was, have you been sanctified? Hmm. 
whereas a lot of Christians are like, well, I thought that's kind of a gradual ongoing thing that you're thing, ongoing yeah. sanctified. Now, have you been sanctified? Oh, I see. Your pneumatology, the study of the spirit, um, is such that you're convinced that when the unction of the Holy Spirit has come on you in this third category that we're talking about, that's going to be the same. Okay. You have yet another group of Christians that came along. We'll call these the cessationists. And these were the people who got nervous about <laughs> these kind of people that I was just describing. And they said, that feels really woo-woo to us. And so we're going to just say, you know what? The only thing the Holy Spirit does is he comes in you when you get saved and that's the end. And everything else ceased when the earliest Christians died off. And so you don't see that stuff anymore. And there, it's nice and, and tidy. Well, for uh, obvious reasons to me, I look at all of these and I say, huh, you know, I can understand how each of you got there, but I wouldn't sign up for any of you um, 100% mm -hmm. um, because I think you built your foundation on a portion, a slice. A slice. You Rather don't have the whole pie. Big picture. And I think we have to, to pull the camera back and realize that there might be a little bit more that's going on. And, and that's why when I was talking about the third, this third category, this third touch, I was careful not to get too prescriptive. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, I guess if I were to say, well, you know what, I'll start a, a, a movement myself. The way that you get touched by the Holy Spirit is you go to breakfast with an old friend that you had some hurt feelings with and you make amends and maybe tears will come right there in the restaurant. You'll cover your face with the napkin so the waitress isn't thinking, what is going on? That's really weird. And then you'll get on an airplane and you'll go see your friend Ben and he'll tell you this story that all of a sudden will trigger something. And then this one, well, that was my experience, mm -hmm. but I can't be prescriptive mm -hmm. and say that therefore- That's the if experience the, for every That's how you get touched by the Holy Spirit gotcha. in a, in a special sort of way. Right. And so I think this sort of explanation of point three and foundation will help with explaining some of the questions that I came in. I bet so, because they'll probably plug There's in. a lot of questions Good. about it. Um, uh, a question that came in in a couple different ways uh, was around this question of once saved, always saved. Mm -hmm. uh, this is when you're talking about that, you were talking about that initial touch of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, is Jesus is always there after the initial filling. Can we fall out of grace. Mm -hmm. um, and another person may have asked it, can you lose your salvation mm -hmm. through continuing sinning or converting to another religion mm -hmm. or not repenting? Well, okay. So I think that that is, it's, it's obviously a very interesting question. You have Christians who have come along um, uh, who have different conclusions on that looking at scripture. I would say you're always saved if you want to be saved. Now, the hypothetical question is where the, the parsing out of the different theologies comes. If a person says, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. I gave that up 20 years ago. I became a Buddhist or I became a whatever and the, I don't want that. Will God drag you to heaven and say, no, no, you come in here because you got mm -hmm. saved. Well, I don't know of any Christian that would say yes. Now, what you'll have a differing opinion on is somebody will say, well, I guess he was, but now he's not because he said, I don't want that anymore. On the other hand, you'll have Christians who will say, he never really was. Mm -hmm. He just acted like he was mm -hmm. because he couldn't be where he is now if he really had been. Well, how do we know that? We, yeah, can't know that but you end up really at the same place gotcha. either way. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you want to be with Jesus, he wants to be with you. And um, so. That's good. Yeah. Uh, another question came around, around about the uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit in today's world, particularly around spiritual healing. Sure. Um, you see a lot of that in the Bible. Sure. And is that perpetual and is ongoing? Today? Is it happening yeah. today? It's funny. funny. I was uh, talking about that even with one of our interns over the weekend who uh, we were talking about how 
sometimes you go to a place that's known for the healings that they're doing. And um, he was saying something to the effect of, you know, I've, I've really experienced God there, but sometimes I leave a little bit confused and I'm really wondering, is that real or is that, you know, was that legitimate? And the answer is, I don't know the answer because I don't, I've been to that place and I told him, I don't know that person who's the preacher and, and I can't really say, but I do know this from my experience. If it really is genuine, typically the next morning when you wake up and you're thinking about that, you're not going, that was not real. You just continue to have this sense of, that was the most amazing thing that God just did. I know that I know that I know God was in that place. Now, I do think sometimes, back to the categories that we were talking about, if the Lord showed up in a, in a ministry or in a church and he did some healings, because I do believe he still does. I am not a cessationist. I do believe the Holy Spirit is still alive and well and working today, just as in scripture. I do think though, that some Christians come along and pastors and churches, and for whatever reason, God's uh, hand of anointing and blessing and favor is upon them and, and some, they pray for healing and people get healed. So they do it again the next week and people get healed. And they do it the next week and people get healed. And they're like, I guess I'm just a healer. And, but, but I think here again, we have to be very careful. We can't presume upon the Holy Spirit. Um, and I think this is where sometimes churches and movements and whole denominations maybe have gotten a little bit confusing because the unction moved on to do something else or wanted to but they kept doing the same thing that they'd always been doing. Mm -hmm. And so 20 years later, they're still saying, and if you'll come forward and you'll do it and this, you'll have this experience. And people are like, okay, so like this, and th is it working? You know, and but well here at this point, you, you're, you've gotten enamored by the function or, or rather by the form, by the forms of what was happening but we can't put the Holy Spirit in a bottle and just right. keep uncorking him on demand mm -hmm. and just saying, this is how it always happens. Mm -hmm. So that would be the answer. Um, uh, does he still heal? Absolutely, he still does. Do I have a formula or an address that you can go to and this is where it's, no, I don't. But sometimes he does have a place and he just, sometimes he's done it here. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's glorious when he does. That's good. Um, another question that came in, and there was a couple different versions of this question too. Um, I've heard it said by some that only those who speak in tongue, uh, which they call the evidence of the Spirit, is can truly have the Holy Spirit. Right, right. Uh, is, is that how we know that we have the right, Spirit? Right, right. Well, yeah, and no. The answer, I believe, is no. And that goes back to what I was explaining a few minutes ago. I do believe that the gift of tongues uh, is still a very active spiritual gift. And uh, don't discount that in the slightest. I do not believe that if a person hasn't had or utilized that gift, that they have not been filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, any more than I do not believe that if a person hasn't preached the sermon, they haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit because that's my gift. And you know, I could easily say, you haven't know, been filled with you and preached. Um, this is what happened to Peter, right? Mm -hmm. He preached, I preached, that's the sign. No, I can't do that. Um, so I, I think we have to be careful not to uh, box in and say, this must this be your the experience. One thing, yeah. mm -hmm. But if you've had that experience and that's, um, going on in your life spiritually? Well, praise the Lord. Wonderful. Awesome. Okay, so uh, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we uh, can't help but talk about the Trinity. So there yes. are questions that came around Father, that, Son, talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are the three ways that God shows himself mm -hmm. to us. Does this mean that they're all the same person, but manifesting himself in different ways mm -hmm. and roles throughout history? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's precisely what it means. Uh, uh, you go, th back to the very beginning of the Bible. And um, this is where we see God the Father at work. 
doing this creating. Jesus himself would refer to him as Father, Abba, Father. Um, but interestingly, right back there at the very beginning in Genesis, it talks about how um, he created the light and the world and the water and everything out of nothing. And But before any of it started, uh, when it was null and void and formless, the Spirit of mm -hmm. the Lord hovered. So the Holy Spirit is, is uh, right in there, even though he's not going to be uh, accentuated until you get to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Even in the Old Testament, you do have points where the Holy Spirit is going to show up. He comes upon Elijah that day when he was up on Mount Carmel and the people who are worshiping the idols of Baal um, and doing all the sacrificing and, and trying to call down fire from heaven. And the Holy Spirit just comes upon Elijah and wow, you know, what happens? And so you have these scenes in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit would just come, but you don't have this uh, th thorough outpouring of the Holy Spirit that you get in the New Testament after Acts. After Jesus leaves, he says, it's good for me to go because then I can send mm -hmm. my Holy Spirit. And the great thing about that is then I can be everywhere mm -hmm. and in all of you um, at the same time. Okay, so my follow-up question is about what you just talked about mm -hmm. right there, about the Jesus, Jesus going so the Holy Spirit can mm -hmm. come. And this question says that in the discipleship group recently, if the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father, but all three are the triune God, then why could Jesus not stay with the Holy Spirit? Text says that he had to leave for the Spirit to come. Is there a better understanding of this? Yeah, I kind of understand the question. Why can't Jesus and the Spirit be here at the same time? I think is, why did right. he have to go well, for let's, the Well, okay, Spirit let's go come? back to the original. There's there's a little problem in the premise of the question. Okay. If God is not the Father, if God is, if the Father, Father is not the Son, Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, well, they are. <laughs> they are the same. So, um, so let's, let's get that established, f first of all. I was telling the people in my small group, we were perplexed about the, the Trinity the other night. And so I used a very pedestrian illustration that I had heard when I was a kid that seemed to make sense to me. And that being uh, the picture of a cherry pie. But the cherry pie has to be one of the really good kind of cherry pies that has the really gooey kind of filling that flows or not the coagulated lumpy kind of filling. And I remember the speaker saying, suppose you took a knife and you cut into the crust all the way down to the bottom, um, three clear marks in that cherry pie, three big pieces. Now, if it's the good kind of filling, you have to have a spatula and you gotta flip it out because all the cherry filling is gonna ooze mm -hmm. out of the sides. And he said, now, if you could get down underneath the crust before it was cut, and even after it's cut, that, that filling is still flowing um, together. Well, in a very simplistic sort of way, this is how God is somehow. There's three clear manifestations that he uh, enabled us to see him in and as and does still, but he's one uh, God. Now, why he manifests, when he manifests, the way that he manifests, I think we'll have to ask him uh, mm -hmm. that in the end, because I can't say, well, here's why he had to do, well, I guess in his own plan is this was what had to happen. It's good, <laughs> it's good. Uh, I think this message um, was really good in that it cleared up a lot of questions, I think, that people have about the Holy Spirit That's and, and how you're filled with it. So good. thank you for that and uh, excited that you got to share more of your story mm -hmm. and what God's doing here mm -hmm. um, and excited to see what the Holy Spirit does uh, in, in the, the lives of, of people in the days ahead. So thank you for that. And Thanks. thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. 
help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.